Good afternoon. I'm Peter Bergen. I run the uh, International Security Program at New America. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Becky Frankel, who has been a longtime friend of New America. Um, we've known um, you worked with us for, I don't uh -huh. know, five years at mm -hmm. least. And Becky, as you know, has come out with War Dogs, uh, which uh, <coughs> got rave reviews in the Washington Post and in other fora. Mm -hmm. And so she's going to talk uh, about the big themes and stories in her book, and then we'll open up Q&A. Um, well, thank you everyone for coming. It's nice to have a small group. <laughs> so I appreciate you coming in the middle of the day. Um, so yeah, so the, the book has been well received and that's really nice for me, but I think it's even nicer because it's, it's being shared by um, all of the handlers and the community that surrounds them, um, which is sort of a protective community. Um, they are very committed and passionate about what they do. And I think that um, you know, to be able to highlight not only what they do or not only their sort of harrowing stories, because I think people get very attached to the idea that, you know, dogs are, are heroes, and certainly they are, but um, the uh, difference they're making is very significant, and I take it very seriously, and I know they do too. So to have people be, you know, coming to this topic in that way is um, a great thing. Um, so this started in part uh, with uh, my work at Foreign Policy. I work with Tom Rex, who is <coughs> associated uh, with Peter and uh, the New America Foundation, and also is a wonderful guy and a very um, prominent and talented and um, dogged journalist. He was you know, the Iraq War correspondent for the Washington Post. He covered the Pentagon for the Wall Street Journal. And um, I started to work with him for the best defense. Um, and as I got to know Tom, uh, who has a sort of an intimidating presence, I think at first, as sort of a younger journalist um, working with him, and I found out that he has these two very small dogs, and he loves them very, very much. Um, and that was just sort of a way that we bonded, and it was a way that I, I got to know him, um, and it was through his, his dogs. And actually, at the time, I had a cat, and he wanted to hear nothing about it. <laughs> he was not interested in my cat at all. So we just talked about his dogs. Um, and one of my, my jobs at Foreign Policy is I uh, do a lot of photo editing. And during that time, uh, this was like 2008, uh, a lot of the photos that were coming off the wire from Afghanistan and Iraq were war images, certainly. And, and those images are very gritty and, and sort of hard to look at. And you become kind of accustomed to them, uh, I think. And, uh, but one photo came across, and I saw it and sort of stopped and thought, I have to send this to Tom. And it was a picture of um, Marines uh, in Helmand province, and they were with their bomb-sniffing dogs at their barracks, which was essentially this very makeshift outside um, arrangement near, you know, you could see the HESCO borders in the background. But they looked so happy. Um, the dogs have these, like, huge smiles on their faces, and it was just such a contrast, such a stark contrast to everything else that I had been seeing. And so I sent it to him, and of course he got very excited about it and asked me to find some more, and I said, okay. Sure, I'm happy to look for photos of dogs for you. Um, and, and I found a lot more. And it's a very rich and deep subject. And it goes back hundreds and hundreds of years. And there are these little sort of gems, these little nuggets in history. And I was finding them you know, in papers from World War I reports um, to Vanity Fair or to the New York Times. And so we started to do the War Dog of the Week post, which, <laughs> <laughs> which led to this, which was, which was wonderful. Um, but and that it, but just, it didn't, wasn't the most widely read story of, on FP of all time was? Yes, for, for a long time running. I think one other piece has now surpassed it. Um, but when the, mm. the news about the Osama bin, La bin Laden mission came out uh, in May 2011, um, there was this little piece of piece in the report that there had been a dog on the mission, and they named the dog Cairo, and they said that the dog had been with the U.S. Navy SEALs. And that wasn't surprising to me at all, but people kind of went bananas over this news, and I <laughs> thought, well, all right, fine, you know. Um, my, my boss at the time, Susan Glasser, said, well, just pull together some photos, put, you know, and just do it. And I can say this to you, it's a small group, but I was actually supposed to go on vacation with a friend, and I was like, oh, I don't want to do this. <laughs> I just want to go out of town, and I, I pulled together some photos and just tried to answer the question of why, why doesn't it surprise me, or why shouldn't it surprise the rest of us that there was a dog on this mission? And so I pulled together some photos, and um, it went viral, as they say, and uh, I did not get to go on vacation, but uh, I got to, to do a little bit of press, and uh, it did very well for the magazine. 
And then the opportunity to write the book kind of came to me, even though Tom for a long time had been saying, oh, this should be a book. Um, but I think the connection that I made with Tom over dogs um, actually proved to sort of be the, um, the path that I forged into this community that is so protective, that is so defensive of um, the work that they do and their, and their dogs. Because I think a lot of time, people from the outside um, might see the training that they do, uh, which is intense. At times, it's very, very, very physical and can be kind of rough. These dogs, some of them are, you know, they weigh up to 100 pounds, and they're very aggressive, and they've got really sharp teeth. and. They're trained to do patrol work, which is bite work. And um, so they, you know, the first time I was, uh, the first trip that I went on was to Langley Air Force Base, a handler that I knew through just, I called him, I found a story about his kennels, which is at the US Air Force Academy in Colorado. And he was touring the country, giving these clinics to smaller teams of handlers through the Air Force. And the first time I, I went to watch them train, he told me later that he was really nervous about having me in the yard with them because he had to handle this one dog who sort of got worked up into a frenzy and, and couldn't be calmed down any other way than, but for him to become a little physical. And I thought it was funny because the whole time I wasn't watching him, but I was watching the dog um, just to sort of see how the dog was reacting. And the dog was fine. So I, I didn't see that as abuse, but, but they are. Uh, kind of standoffish a little bit until they sort of get get that you get dogs and get that you get the work that they're doing. Um, but I sort of found through my research and my reporting trips and you know these conversations that you have, even though you're talking about dogs, yes, you are still always talking about war. And I and you know I'm asking these men and women about the worst days possibly, hopefully, of their lives. Um, they watched friends die. They had, you know, IEDs explode in front of them, especially the Marines who went into Iraq in 2003 uh, bore the worst brunt of sort of our unpreparedness <coughs> to combat IEDs. And so, you know, one Marine told me, excuse me, that he had been blown up uh, no less than 13 times in a period of six months. Wow. Um, and of the Marines he went originally to Iraq with in uh, 2003, only out of the 12 of them, I think only uh, 10 of them had survived. Uh, excuse me, 10 of them had been killed. Only two of them had, had survived. Um, and was he with these EOD technicians? No, they weren't. No, oh, um, they're dog handlers. They they weren't dog handlers actually. Uh, dog handlers didn't go <coughs> into Iraq until 2004. It took okay. them a, about a year for them to pull together first the <coughs> idea that they could be of use to them, um, and then to uh, because the dogs, the dog teams that were first sent in, the ones that they deemed to be the sort of most ready for this kind of work still weren't trained to track IEDs because nobody knew that they would need dogs to do that. Mm. They weren't anticipating this threat, at least in the way that I think it, they met with it uh, once on the ground. Um, so they had to sort of learn as they went. Um, but if you were to ask a Vietnam handler um, who went to war with a dog, who uh, used dogs for scouting on patrol, so it meant that the handlers and the dogs were out in front, and they used the dogs as sort of a, a, a measure for danger. So the way the, the way that they would do it is that there's a, a leash between the dog and the handler, and as long as the leash is taut, it means the dog is comfortable going forward. Mm. Once they perceive a threat of any kind, whether it's they're smelling uh, ammunition, they're smelling guns, they're smelling humans, they're hearing noises in the trees, if maybe it's a sniper, They'll stop, and then the leash goes slack. So in, yeah. the, in the dark, this is a very good way to judge whether or not you can move forward. It's a soundless, mm. uh, quiet way. So if you had asked a handler, a Vietnam handler in 2003, what they should be doing with the dogs, they could have told you exactly what they would have been good at. Um, but unfortunately, um, Vietnam in particular, uh, the dog program was disbanded, um, and mostly because they left the dogs there in Vietnam and sort of the haste to leave mm. the country and the evacuation, which is um, a terrible chapter in our uh, dog history, as it were. Um, and many of these handlers are still very much uh, traumatized. It's hard for them to talk about their dogs because they didn't know the dogs were being left behind. Mm. Um, but in any event, so, <laughs> so moving forward. So, but I found um, that talking to people about their dogs 
first was a, a way to establish a very solid uh, connection, and that actually made it much easier um, to talk about war through talking about a dog. Mm. Um, and that might seem <coughs> simple, but it actually sort of worked. Um, and I think it sort of, people have so much love for their dogs if you're a dog lover, then of course you already know this, but, um, and there's many reasons why humans connect more easily with canines than they do with other species. There's all these fantastic studies that have been done to show that um, in fact there is a, a, a bond um, and a sort of a biology between, between the species. So <coughs> for example, um, you, we might take for granted that you know, when you talk to your dog and you, you tell them like, we're gonna go for a walk, and they, of course, they know what you mean. You're sort of, you made a gesture, and they know what the leash means, and so, okay, they're at the door. They, that is communication. It's easy, it's simple, and you don't think about it. Um, you didn't train them necessarily to understand that leash means walk, that they just know this. Um, but in fact, it's actually not uh, so unremarkable uh, as that, you know, there's a woman in Sweden who conducted a study between communication between humans and chimps and humans and dogs, and you would think that Chimps are much <coughs> closer <laughs> in terms of uh, biology to humans than, than certainly dogs are. But in fact, it's much easier to communicate with a dog. So her experiment was um, she was sitting across from a chimp uh, that knew her. They'd sort of been uh, in the clinic together for a long time. And she had three, three cups. And she took a piece of food. Mm -hmm. And she took a cup. And she put the food down. And she covered it with a cup. And so then she starts talking to the chimp. And she said, the food is here. Here's the food, and she's using her voice, and she's gesturing, and her face is also communicating, and the chimp is doing anything but listening to her. She's picking up the cups, and she's looking around, but at no point is there any sense that one is sort of reading off the other. And then it flashes to the same experiment, but this time with a dog, and the food is on the floor. And then she walks into the room, and from the minute she comes into the room, the dog is focused on her. He's looking at her, he's tracking her, and she says, the food is here. She says the dog's name, like, you know, Rex, the food is here. And he goes right to where she shows him. And maybe he smelled it, but, you know, um, because dogs do have incredible um, <coughs> uh, sensory powers. Their noses are amazing. Um, but in fact, you know, the dog was, was listening to her, was communicating with her. Didn't Anderson Cooper do a form of this experiment on 60 Minutes a few months ago? I don't know. I yeah. might have missed it. Yeah. Did he with the dog? Yeah. OK. So, so he's testing and proving the theory then, I guess. Yeah. Um, but it is, I mean, it's, so for me, that was really a, sort of a profound realization that actually there is so much more to this that seems so um, natural and simple between humans and dogs, um, which I think just sort of resonates to why human-to-human um, -human contact through this uh, thread of a dog and through the, the love and affinity we have for dogs makes talking about war um, a little bit easier. And uh, so, th so that was an interesting part of the book for me. Um, also, something that was surprising uh, was to find out that a lot of the handlers had a hard time, even if they could talk about how much they loved their dogs, it was very hard for some of them to use the word. Um, I think that part of it might come from the training, the, the older school of training is always, you know, you're not supposed to get attached to your dog. Um, you know, don't treat your dog like a pet. And, and certainly that is important. Uh, when the dogs are working, they're working, just like when you're working, you're working. You, you can, you know, it's easier to do your job if you're focused solely on the task at hand, and same for a dog. Um, but I was very surprised that when I actually asked the question, you know, so do you think your dog loves you then? And some of them said, no, no, they don't. I said, well, we were just talking five minutes ago about how you lost your first dog and how it was the first time you cried in front of your, you know, the, the men and women that you work with and, and how hard it is for you still to think about them, but you don't think that that's about love. And, and they would say no, and they rely oftentimes on this uh, sort of alpha wolf pack speak, which is, um, I think, still pretty common in, in training dogs. And we rely on the model of a, a wolf pack, which mm. uh, I think uh, originally it was the idea that there was the alpha and then the, uh, <coughs> the betas who sort of fall in line behind the one, the one wolf. Um, but if you read a little bit more about some of the recent writings on dogs, they look at wolf packs not as hierarchies, but actually as families. So mm. the relationships are uh, really more about bonding and loving than, mm. than sort of following the leader. Um, 
So I, this was sort of what I came away with. Of course, you know, handlers and dogs, the, the, ex the emotion exchanged, you know, is, is love. It's whether it's familial or, um, you know, a bond between friends. It is, even if you can't use the word, then, then it is um, very much about, uh, about connecting. And I also found that, you know, the dogs and the handlers that seemed closer performed better, um, which to me would, would be something you'd think that they would want to foster um, because if we are relying again mm. on this sort of understanding that dogs and humans have this unique ability to communicate, that doesn't it seem to make more sense than that the closer they are, the better their communication is and the better they will perform um, as a team. Um, and I learned this lesson um, very, uh, <laughs> uh, very uh, viscerally uh, on my own because uh, at one um, training exercise I went to, I spent uh, a week in Colorado, and I went to a bunch of different military bases there. Um, excuse me. Um, and at Fort, um, actually at Buckley Air Force Base, um, I was watching a, a number of different teams do uh, a number of dis different searches. They were searching for drugs, and they were searching for explosives. And so we get to this bathroom, and one of the sergeants says, OK, Rebecca, you know, it's your turn. And I was very comfortable sort of <coughs> hanging out in the back and taking pictures and writing notes and being very quiet. And they said, no, 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 it's your turn. You're going to find the bomb. Mm. And so they gave me the leash to this dog. It's named Haas. He's a German uh, short-haired pointer. And we had been getting along very well. Uh, Haas was a really gentle dog. He was uh, people friendly. And so we'd been hanging out. And I thought, OK, well, this might not be so bad. I think I can do this. I've been watching all of these handlers for, you know, for hours we'd been doing this. And I was studying them very closely, so I thought, OK. And I was a little bit nervous because it was me and about 12 other kind of big dudes. And they were all going to watch me in this very brightly lit bathroom. And so I took the leash, and that was it. They just said, find the bomb. So I thought, OK, I can do this. And so I get into the bathroom, and I tell a hoss, I say, seek. And I like tell him, you know, I point to the door seam, or the, excuse me, the seam uh, where the wall meets the floor, which is how you conduct your search. So you go clockwise around the mm. room. And he did it. He followed me. And I thought, OK, so here we go. And he's moving very fast because um, these are not slow searches, right? Like, if there really is a bomb in this bathroom, then you want to mm. find it. And you want to find it very fast. So Haas just like takes off and goes. And we go to the sink. And I you know, tell him to hop up. And he gets up on the, not all the way up, but he puts his front paws in the sink. And then we're, we're doing pretty well. And then we hit the bathroom stalls. And so the first one was fine. I managed to open the door, and I got him to go around sort of the, the toilet. And I'm in there with him, and it's crowded. Uh, but he gets <laughs> out, and then he shoots out ahead of me. And he goes to the third one instead of the second one, so I have to pull him back. And then we get into the second one, and he gets all tangled up in the leash. And then I get tangled up in the leash, and I was <coughs> I could hear them snickering in the doorway, and I could feel my <coughs> face getting red. But I was like, I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to give up. And so we get to the second stall, and then we come out. And it happens. The tangling happens all over again. And I, the, the bathroom door hit me in the back, and it really hurt. And I just <laughs> thought in my head, I just thought, I can't do this. And I was still, at, at the moment while I was saying that, I was still giving the motions. I was still telling Haas to go forward. And he just stopped right there and sat in the middle of the floor. And he looked over at the guys in the door, and he was like, no, she can't do this. <laughs> and he, I mean, he really exposed me. And <laughs> it was, but it was a very quick lesson because a number of things that they had been telling me all the way up until this point, I had not, I had been listening to, but I had not been mm. absorbing. And those things are one, uh, the emotions run up and down the leash. That's something handlers say all the time. So mm. when you get frustrated, your dog is going to feel that you get frustrated. Mm. Um, if you're nervous, your dog might be nervous, but also, it works the other way, too. So if your dog is sensing danger, then you should be able to sort of feel mm. that. Um, and also, if a dog doesn't trust you, they're not going to <laughs> that follow you. You mm. know, that they're very intelligent animals. They know how to do the job they're supposed to do. And Haas was like, you don't know what you're doing. That's it. What, what are the, you know, the, the, the breeds of choice? Um, so mostly right now, the military, the United States military, uses uh, German Shepherds and Belgian Malinois. Yeah. And the reasons for that are German Shepherds are very intelligent dogs, um, which means that if you're a handler for a German Shepherd, you have to keep them engaged. You, you can't have a rote sort mm. of like we do the same training all the time mm. because they're going to get bored. Or they're going to think ahead of you and know that, OK, I know if I sit down and alert, you're going to give me my toy which is sort of their driving uh, ambition there. 
Um, <laughs> and the Belgian Malinois have this crazy high work drive. I mean, these dogs could work and work and work and work until they drop. They just Cairo was a Belgian Malinois. So they say yes. Yeah. Although I've I've heard off the record that his name is not Cairo. Okay. Um, but well, let's let's assume that his name was Cairo yeah. for the moment. Uh, <coughs> what was he doing? What was he supposed to be doing? So I I would guess that what he was doing is um, <coughs> probably there. So special forces dogs are trained a little bit differently. Um, you know, there's no record of them, of course, uh, and what they do. Um, and I I was able to watch one. They're, they have covert identities. They do. <laughs> they do. And so I got to know um, some veterinarians stationed in Bagram, um, <coughs> really a, a team of three. They're really wonderful. And they saw all the dogs that came through mm. Afghanistan. Um, and they would tell me, you know, they told me how many special forces dogs they had, but there were no records of them kept mm. necessarily. And um, when they were killed, no record is kept of how many dogs are mm. killed. Um, so that was actually one thing that was really hard for me to do was to determine how many dogs have been killed since uh, we mm. started in Iraq because while records are kept, each branch keeps their own records. They all keep them differently. Um, some of them will put down a cause of death. Some of them won't. And so it's, it's complicated. Um, but what, what Cairo would have been doing, I would have guessed, is uh, possibly there for um, helping to detain anyone who might have tried to flee on foot. Um, because yeah. if you've ever if you've ever watched any of these bite training, you know these dogs. If if somebody is running at a great speed and the dogs chase them down, the momentum that catches when they connect and when they hit, it's it's unbelievable um, mm. how hard they go down. And uh, actually, that was something else I did in training. I got into the bite suit and I I I went and got bit. <laughs> And I was wearing not the thickest mm. jacket because those are really enormous, and so <coughs> it didn't fit me, so I couldn't wear it. Um, <laughs> but the one that I was wearing, I they said, "No, you're not going to feel anything." Like he, he's they they train the dogs to catch people like right here on their arms, or right here on their chest, or on their legs. But this is the best way to if they're chasing someone at a high speed and they catch them here and go down. It's very easy for them, right? They pull, they can pull the person down. Mm. Whereas if they were to hit their legs, they might stop them, but not totally knocked mm. them off their feet. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I felt it. I felt every bit of it, and it really hurt. <laughs> and mm. I, I, excuse me, um, I uh, had a bruise afterwards, and I've seen some of the bruises on these, you know, much really, these like really big, broad, muscular arms, and they're, they're like this big. They're huge, and it looks like, you know, somebody sort of just painted <coughs> it black. Mm. My bruise was very big for me, but it was not. Uh, <laughs> it was like, you know, a paper cut compared to like a gunshot wound. It was nothing to complain about, but it, it if I can't imagine what that would feel like without anything. Talk, talk us through the uh, reporting uh, mm. process. I mean, did you do this big literature review about dogs and then mm. dogs in the military? And then you, where did you travel to and how did? So I went to um, <coughs> a bunch of different military bases only here in the United States. Um, and for me, it was more about where I knew people. Mm. Um, I tried to avoid at all costs going through the military's public affairs office. Um, mm. While I, I, I certainly appreciate and respect the work that they do, you know, if you want to really know anything about how this works, you go right to the source. Um, you don't want someone sort of walking around making sure you're not asking certain questions. And so. And they didn't have to go through their public affairs to do um, that? I didn't. I ended up yeah. not, not being yeah. able to. Um, I always had permission to be where I yeah. was. Um, but there was at one point, um, well, off, off the record, I will say that at one point I, I was able to go watch something I, I didn't have permission to do and I did have to hide in a van <laughs> for a little <laughs> while. Um, <coughs> but in, in, and, and the reason why I think that they allowed me to do this is because I really was first and foremost interested in educating myself. I mm. wanted to know everything that they were willing to show me. And so if they said, where we start, um, you know, PT at 5 a.m. And I would say, okay, I'll be here at, at 4.45. And, you know, I didn't leave until they left at night. And Are the trainers mostly men? They are mostly men. Um, it is a very, the military, uh, you know, there's a lot of ego and, and machismo. And certainly there is that in the, the dog handling field. Um, a lot of handlers like to talk about, you know, who's got the baddest dog and whose dog bites the hardest. <laughs> um, you know, it's a thing, you know, they, they talk about it, um, 
<laughs> but the handlers I, I found were to be the the ones at least that I gravitated towards were the ones who would say things like, you're never done learning. You can learn mm. from everyone, you know. And are they people who go into this field, uh, that's what they're going to do? Mm. A lot of them that I met wanted to, you know, work with dogs in either a police force uh, capacity, which, you know, it's very hard to have a long career in dog handling in the military. There's only a few rungs to climb, and then once you get to the top, you kind of can What is the top rank? Uh, kennel master. What's that? Kennel master. Okay, and is that a, a what is that rank equivalent of? Um, I think it's like an E four or yeah. five. I'm not. I'm not yeah. sure. Um, but. It but it's a, it's enlisted or is it an off? I mean, is it is it? So some. The, the the dog handling community in the military is like a microcosm of the the larger military, so it's very small. Um, it's very very small. Um, even though I think that it is important to acknowledge how big an impact such a small community mm. is having over across the broader, especially in combat zones. Um, but it's like any any job field, right? The the higher you go, the finer yeah. the, the point is at the top, and so those opportunities are fewer and further between. And um, uh, but not all of them are enlisted mm -hmm. at that point. Um, but I think it's very rare to get a high ranking position like that and have retired out of the military. So um, how, how is the, you've had all these great reviews. Uh, you've gone around the country. I mean, what do, what do, I'm looking to throw it open to anybody with for questions, mm. unless you've you got something else you wanted to say. Or I mean, I can talk about this yeah, forever, yeah, okay. so I'd rather, I'd rather <laughs> talk about what throw people throw are interested in. So like, you know, what has been the overall response? I mean, who's, uh, you, we were talking earlier, you mean, you've got this big Venn diagram of mm. the military, which is a big group, and people mm. who, and then big group of people who love dogs, and the sort of yeah. like this group in the center, but they're, the people, what, what, you tell me what you just told me earlier before we, when we went, walked out to lunch. Oh, um, you know, it's, it's a definitely a mix. Um, a lot of what, I, what I've enjoyed a lot um, in doing some of these sort of talks and then meeting people, one couple, you know, when you're, when you're giving a talk and, or you're talking to a group of people and you're sort of looking and making eye contact, there was this one couple and they were sitting in the back and they just were so happy. They were just so happy, and then they came mm. up to me afterwards, and it turns out that their son had been a handler in Afghanistan. Mm. He just um, finished his service, I think, with the Marines, and he's okay, but he has his dog, and he loves his dog, and they, they felt like, you know, they wouldn't have wanted to have sent him without the dog. They felt like the dog kept him safe, mm. and that they, you know, would have done anything to, for this dog, you know, th that they're so grateful and thankful, and um, those kinds of things are nice. I was in Tampa. Tampa or St. Petersburg, rather, um, a couple of weeks ago, they had a book fair. And I, I hadn't expected this, so I wasn't really prepared for it. And I, I wish I had sort of uh, replied a little bit differently. But um, this man came up, and he didn't say anything. He just handed me a post-it note um, and his book that he wanted signed. And on the note, it just said Rex, and it had a number. And I knew that that meant it's the, the ID number, the tattoo number that they put in the dog's ear, the, mm. uh, like their dog tag. and. It, I realized by his age, of course, that he had been in Vietnam, and we had, I had been talking uh, in the talk about what had happened to this one handler and how he tried for years and years to find his dog and how, you know, this still sort of rattles him and, and to know that she had been killed and without him being there, without knowing, it just is like this thing that, that haunts him. And he, this man didn't say anything to me. He just sort of handed me his book, and I said, this was your dog, and he just sort of said yes, and he was... I think kind of overwhelmed with emotion and mm. so that means a lot to me to have those kinds of meetings. Um, but what I was telling Peter is that uh, a woman wrote me an email and said there was too much swearing in my book and that she couldn't get through the first chapter and had to return it to the library. So I thought, all right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. I but I mean, you're also saying, you know, I mean, people who have an interest in the military have a strong interest and people who have an interest oh, yes. in dogs have a strong interest. So it's like these the two communities that are pretty intense. The enthusiasm is e extreme, um, and <laughs> and that's that's kind of a wonderful thing to know that you know people who care about something so much are finding value, because it means then that if you know like a anyone who's a diehard fan of any you know sort of niche topic that you you consume as much as you can. So I'm sure they've already read all the wonderful books on this topic, or read just wonderful books about dogs, and there are so many of them. Um, I have a huge dog library now. Dog book library, I should say. Um, what so are the best books on dogs? Um, 
on dogs in general, I, I was particularly drawn to Mark Durr's books. Um, he's written for The Atlantic before. Um, he's, he's, I, I talked to him for hours. He's a really interesting man, but he wrote a book called um, The Dog's History of America, huh. which is fascinating. Um, he's a he's an very intelligent writer, um, and he has these wonderful little stories about you know, dogs all the way through. Um, and you know he writes about how Columbus used dogs and huh. to to very horrific degrees as sort uh, of um, hunting people down. Yeah, and using them to kill people. Uh -huh. So um, not not a not a great guy, Columbus. <laughs> do you have um, thoughts about what your next project might be? I do have. Some Is it going to be in the canine field? Um, I I certainly came across many. Uh, like, you know, you go sort of down these, like, rabbit holes, and I was <laughs> really particularly interested in World War I. Mm. Um, some of the best books on uh, animals and war, I think, came out of that time period. Um, Arnold Harris, Harris Baines is the last name. Um, Ernest Harold Baines, I think, is his name. He wrote a book called um, Animals in the Great War. And, and it's he's just... British. Yes. <coughs> so yes. it's like a perfect storm. Really. Yes. British love dogs and they love the First World War. And uh, absolutely. <laughs> and it's written in sort of, you know, each, each uh, wartime has its own sort of... Uh, Vernacular? Exactly. Yeah. But, you know, the World War II, it's sort of, there's a lot of like Nancy Drew type writing. So it's like, golly gee, this dog was, was great. <laughs> and um, World War I, it's, it's very gentlemanly, you know, sort of um, archaic. Yeah. Vocabulary, but they're they're wonderful, and and the stories are wonderful. But there are uh, so this Vietnam handler um, Ron Aiello that I interviewed, uh, who brought his dog Stormy to Vietnam. He was a Marine. Uh, he goes to these uh, handler reunions every few years for the Vietnam guys, and maybe mm -hmm. about ten years ago they were having one in New Jersey somewhere, and so they all got together, his group of friends that have stayed in touch, and. They went to New Jersey and they realized that it was a reunion for World War II handlers, that they had just mm. not paid attention to the flyers or something, and it just sort of ended up there by accident. <laughs> and he said, oh, well, I'll just sort of stay. And they ended up, he said, they ended up staying in one hotel room with a bunch of guys or in some part of their hotel for like almost 24 hours together, mm. almost the whole time just telling stories. And he said, you know, it didn't, in the end, it didn't really make a difference that it wasn't the same war because the stories were sort mm. of the same. So I think that that mm. is definitely true. Anybody has a question? Sir? How many people oh, I'm with VOA? Mm -hmm. uh, how many dogs are currently in uh, active duty? And uh, do they use these dogs to breed new dogs to f for war dogs? Mm -hmm. So the United States Military Working Dog Program is uh, the, br the overseeing branch is the Air Force. So the sort of main hub is at San Antonio, and in San, San Antonio at Lackland Air Force Base in Texas. And they have the dog training school there. They have the um, big veterinary hospital there that they call the Walter Reed for dogs. Huh. Um, and then they have the breeding program there. So they breed Belgian Malinois. Um, mm. And they have a litter. Uh, they have lots of litters. They all get assigned a letter. So it, they have a double consonant, uh, double, double letter before, you know, at the beginning of every name. So the R litter had Ruck and Risky and mm. the R-R-I-S-K-Y. Uh, so they do, um, and currently right now the entire program has about 1,200 dogs, I think. Um, but these are not dogs in combat zones. These are dogs, you know, stationed at any base, any military base around the world, the United mm. States military base. So um, the, the numbers are much fewer than they were about five years ago. They're they're drawing down the canine forces. <laughs> <laughs> there, <But> there's a <laughs> drama. <drawdown>. So. <coughs> Uh, Peter Jewell, I'm from Center for American Progress, more here in my capacity as a dog person. So, <laughs> uh, so we're building off of that question, why the Air Force? And my, my main, main question is, what's the sort of the career path for the dog? And what happens to the dog when mm -hmm. he or she gets mustered out of military service? Yeah. Um, I, I don't actually know why the Air Force took over as sort of the overseeing branch. I would think that it would have been the Marines, but possibly because um, the Marines are, are much smaller in terms of, you know, particularly in terms of the canine program. They, uh, the way that they use dogs is a little, a little bit, not in their capacity in sort of a day-to-day -day job, but in terms of when we enter a conflict, how the Marines, they sort of, you know, tip of the spear go in. Yeah. Um, so it's a good question that I don't have an answer to. Um, but uh, 
so in terms of a dog's career field, a uh, path rather, um, dogs operate very differently. They get assigned to a home station and they don't leave unless they're transferred for a particular reason. Um, and so it's the handlers that kind of come in. They cycle in and out um, <coughs> as they move to their different assignments. Um, but a dog and a handler always deploy together and mm. they return to the home station together. Uh, and then if a dog gets assigned a new handler, then, then the process always takes place at the home station. Um, but it really depends on the dog, um, sort of maybe just like any other individual in the <coughs> military. Um, some dogs have longer working careers, working lives than, than others. They just weather it better. Um, but it's a hard, sort of a harder life, you know. Um, so some of these dogs start aging out. They can age out as early as nine. Mm. Um, but some of them have been, some of them are in their whole, their whole lives. So, but when it is time for a dog to sort of finish their military service, then what happens is there's a review process and the veterinarian in charge of the dog who looks at the whole, so dog records are mostly kept through the veterinary records and then they have sort of their training records. So they look at training records, they look at the veterinary records, the handler, the kennel master of the home station, and um, a behaviorist comes in and sort of looks at the dog to make sure that if they're going to retire into a home, what kind of home is most suitable for them. So can they be in a home with other dogs? Can they be in a home with young children? Mm. Um, you know. What is the answer usually? Um, a lot <coughs> of them do do go into to regular homes, um, but some of them, you know, it's a matter of safety. So they're too aggressive, or they have mm. sort of triggers, and um, you know, they're hand, maybe they're hand, they're too one person protective. Mm. Um, so and it sort of all depends. I was curious about the photograph on mm. the cover of the book. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Genesis of the photograph. Yes, yeah, so this is actually, I believe, from a training exercise. Um, my publisher picked that one. Um, but it is it's sort of, they, they do the rappelling um, from sometimes from helicopters. Um, so the photo that kind of launched the vi <coughs> viralness of that um, Osama bin Laden. It's a very famous picture. It, it became one, yes. Right, and did you, did you launch that? I, I think so. I mean, <laughs> certainly I didn't take the photo, but I... Well, um, you see, uh, tell me what it looks like. Tell everybody what mm -hmm. it looks like. It's a very famous picture. Yeah, so it's taken from the back of a Chinook helicopter, and you see uh, presumably the handler and a dog, and they're launching into the water, and you kind of see the dog in midair. And when I first saw the photo, um, I called a few handlers that I knew, and I said, you know, tell me what's going on here, and is this, is this dog going on his own? And some of them said, no, he probably had some help. But then a year later, I decided to track down the photographer and like get the story behind the photo. Mm. And I found him, and we talked for a while. And he said that it was just a lucky shot that this was at the end. The dog and the handler were the last ones of the um, the guys to to take their jump. And what I hadn't realized, if you look out into the water, you see these little tiny like ghostly figures, and it's men in the water, and they're going like this. They're cheering the dog on. Uh. And he said that um, the dog went on his own. The handler went, and the dog went. Um, but you can you can Google these things. There's uh, a lot of handlers that will uh, they take uh, jump out of airplanes with their dogs. They get strapped in. They they teach them to do this. Um, and so you sort of it, I wouldn't I wouldn't jump out of a plane on my own accord. Maybe if it was going <laughs> down and somebody wanted to like give me a push, I would go. But um, so I don't really understand understand the uh, the thrill in that. But you, so you see them go down, and the dog's got a muzzle on, and he's just kind of hanging and handling. And the dog has a, and, but in, does the dog have his own parachute? Or they no, he's strapped into the strapped handler. In, right. So they get strapped in like this, and so they sort of cradle them, and then you see what happens when they get on the ground, and these dogs are like just running around crazy. They're so excited, <laughs> and then in another one I watched, it was it was kind of awesome. It was a handler who had. Um, been in an IED explosion and he lost his, he had to have his feet amputated. Mm -hmm. um, so this video is of him taking his first jump with his dog um, <clears throat> after after mm -hmm. sort of healing up. And you can see the dog knows exactly where they're going. He's like, the way, you know, maybe not to the vet, but like if you're going for a mm -hmm. ride in the car with the dog and the dog likes to stick his head out the window, it's sort mm -hmm. of the same thing. Mm -hmm. So he just can't wait to get on. He's all, he lets himself <laughs> get strapped in. So you have to imagine some of them really do love doing this, even if, you know. Some people wouldn't want to. Gentlemen. What's your favorite 
What's your favorite story of a dog and a handler that you've come across? Oh, there are Too many. So many. <laughs> um, you know, I, w I was thinking about this other day because somebody asked me and I didn't have a good answer ready. Um, but something, and I, I still actually tear up every time I read it, amazingly, it's this uh, Napoleon wrote about coming across a dog. Um, he wrote about it uh, years later when he was in exile, um, sort of looking back on this experience. And he talks about going to into the field after they've sort of devastated this battalion of men and there are just bodies all over the place. And there was this one dog and he was sitting by the, the body of whoever he had been attached to. And when he saw these people come in, the dog got very excited um, and kept running up to Napoleon and then running back to the man on the ground and like licking his hand. And basically, Napoleon was saying that he was clearly imploring him for help. And he said that, you know, in writing about this, he said it was the most moving experience he'd ever had in battle, that at no other time um, in all the lives they laid to waste fighting that he ever felt so ready to um, uh, show mercy on, on the enemy uh, mm. than he did at this dog. So I just... It, it, it just resonated in, in a way that is sort of all of these stories have in the middle of them this very sort of um, bare tenderness to them, I think because dogs offer their service so unconditionally um, and their attachment. They can also be uh, manipulated for quite evil purposes. Then the Nazis used dogs for fairly frequently for they, they rounding people up. And yes, they did. Um, and mm. I think in understanding that, you have to sort of understand that it's not the dogs that right. are evil, yeah, certainly. Right, right. Um, and that what they're doing is just... Following orders. Following orders, exactly. <laughs> um, which which <coughs> might ring a little bit lame, yeah. but it's true. Any other questions? Okay, well, Becky, thank you very much yeah, for this wonderful you. presentation. I'm sure you'll be willing to sign books. Oh, if anyone if, has uh, one, uh, me to sign Thank you, course. Becky, very, very oh, much. Thank you. Thank you for